What's poppin' everybody? Let me know if y'all can hear me. I've got a new audio set up tonight. We're going to try something a bit different. How's everybody going? Oh, thanks for joining me. Tonight we may have a special guest, uh, Burl Tishner from Digital Woodcarver. Uh, if he gets a chance, he's at the factory right now working with the guys. Uh, and if he gets a chance uh, during the class tonight, He's going to pop in, and we're going to do a little bit of an open Q&A with him. <clears throat> and uh, just give some updates and everything. All right. We're going to be uh, starting here in a bit. I want to go over tonight with you all. Um, I'm still getting messages and, and, and during my trainings and stuff with customers and all. I'm still coming across a lot that are, there's a few areas within Vetric where people are still getting stuck. Uh, and, you know, with regards to adding tools to a tool database or, um, you know, how to properly save their files uh, and, um, uh, you know, how to just navigate the software in general. There's going to be a few things that we're going to go over. These are just some of the basics uh, off the top of the head. but the uh i'm hoping to answer any questions that you all have uh it's an open q a tonight and we're gonna go we're gonna do a class but i'm hoping to answer some of your questions and i'm also hoping to um be able to just kind of go over some of these basic things uh, i've had people send comments saying hey i enjoyed watching but you know i'm just beginning and uh some of the classes are a little bit over my head uh and uh not you know i'm not right at that level yet and that's the last thing that i want to hear i mean i love all the feedback but what i don't want is that uh you know uh that people have a hard time following along with the class so i want to try to change up some things uh and um make sure that the projects run smoothly but that i explain them in a way that is um easy for all to understand and i know there's certain things especially when we talk about aspire projects or we talk about text on text or this or that you know there there are things where it's like oh i haven't i'm still at this level i haven't reached that level yet but with the software's user interface and things being so user friendly it should be fairly easy to follow along with and that's what i'm hoping that uh, individuals get from my classes when uh, you know, they come and watch a Spindle TV, uh, you know, live class or a video after, you know, and they're sitting through, uh, you know, a couple hours. You guys are sitting through a couple hours each week. And uh, I want to make sure that I'm doing my job correctly uh, as far as presenting this or explaining this uh, in a way that everybody's like, oh, I get it. OK, so that's kind of hopefully my goal. And then, you know, we may, you know, uh, like I said, we're going to do some Q&A. So if you have any questions and answers or any questions that you need answers to, absolutely ask. That's what we're here for. Uh, and um, we'll also try to uh, hopefully Burl Tishner will have a chance to pop in and uh, talk about a few things with us. All right, let's see what we can do here to get this party started. Bear with me. Bear with me. Let me get my Vetric open. <clears throat> now, one of the most common things that I've run into is if when I'm training someone and all, and I ask them, do you have your Vetric software open? And they're like, um, what, what's that, my VCarve? And yes, so, Let's start off with the CAD CAM program that most of us, uh, if you're if you're joining Spindle TV and you're here and everything, most of the classes or most of the software that we work with is a Vetric brand of software. Uh, we have there's uh, two different forms of that brand. There's VCarve and there's Aspire. Within the VCarve family, there's Vetric VCarve Desktop Design Software and Vetric VCarve Pro. Uh, Vetric being the brand uh, and um, 
then the vCarve, vCarve Desktop and Pro, and Aspire being the uh, the product, the version uh, of the software and everything. Now, most of the times when I'm in classes and everything, you're going to see me working in vCarve Pro, uh, unless I'm doing something that's Aspire related and things like that. But everything that I generally do can be done in all three versions of the software, Vetric vCarve Desktop, vCarve Pro, and Vetric Aspire. Now, <clears throat> CRV files, uh, Vetric's default format when you're saving a Vetric design uh, is typically a CRV file. And the Aspire version of the software, when you save that, it's a CRV 3D. Uh, within the CRV family, we can open up a CRV file within Desktop and Pro, um, but we can't open a CRV 3D file unless we're in Aspire. Uh, all three of the software we can export uh, or import, I'm sorry, we can import uh, JPEGs, PNGs, bitmaps, GIFs and TIFFs, those pixeled images. Uh, and with um, the, when it comes to models, you have your .v3m model files. Those are Vetric model files. And then you have what's called third-party model files, such as STLs, OBJs, .x, 3DS, so on and so forth. Um, within the vCarve family, vCarve Desktop and Pro, we can import one third-party model file per project. So let's say I have a cabin and a horse, and they're both STL files. Well, in my project, if I'm working in Vetric vCarve Desktop or vCarve Pro, I'm only going to be able to use the cabin or the horse, but not both. .v3m files, model files, those are Vetric type formats, and we can import multiple of those in either Vetric vCarve Desktop, Pro, or Aspire. So if I have a cabin, a horse, some mountains and trees, and they're all V3M files, then I can bring them all into a single project to create that model layout. But only one third-party model file per project. Now Aspire has the ability to import multiple third-party model files and uh, multiple V3M files and things. <clears throat> now, what you're seeing on the screen is just kind of uh, what I pulled up in the background. It's that uh, game, uh, Marbles and Jokers. That's that class we did the other night. That file uh, for that game is on in the video. If you go back to that uh, video class, the file for this project is available for download. It's in the description. The link is in the description. Um, but what I wanted to talk about is just some of the kind of get some of the basics and answer some questions and stuff. And we've got some questions rolling in, so we're definitely going to jump into those. Uh, Mike, you'll be first. And then um, Charles, followed by John. Now, just real quick, uh, within the software, there is what's called the Gadget Library. The Gadget Library has the ability, it's basically add-ons. Uh, we have things like the Keyhole Gadget, the Box Making Gadget, the Dovetail Gadget. Now, Vetric vCard Pro and Vetric Aspire have access to this gadget library. Vetric vCard Desktop does not. Um, that's one of the uh, limitations and everything. And so you'll hear people saying, oh, I use the box joint jet gadget or the box maker gadget or the dovetail gadget and all. And if you have Vetric vCard Desktop and you're like, okay, where, where do I get these gadgets from? Um, unfortunately, desktop uh, users don't have access to the gadget library. So multiple DXF, DWG, EPS, AI, Adobe Illustrator, SketchUp files, SKP, SVGs, and any of the Vetric format CRVs, uh, Photo VCard, which is PVC, all of these files we can bring in multiples in Desktop Pro and Aspire. When it comes to models, .v3m, multiples we can bring into all the products. Uh, when it comes to third-party model files such as STLs and OBJs, only one per project in vCarve Desktop and Pro, and you can bring in multiples in Aspire. So that's kind of some of the just the basics. Uh, when you save a design, 
saving your CRV file if you're in the Vetric uh, software, VCarve desktop or pro. Um, saving your design, when you save your design, that saves as a default file format of CRV. If you're in Aspire, it saves as a default format of CRV 3D. <clears throat> the ability to export, we can export designs out of the software. Uh, when we export, we can export as an EPS file, a DXF, an Adobe Illustrator file, uh, SVG and PDF. We can, all three of the softwares can do that. We can export out. And that helps us out greatly. Uh, I know for me, like when I'm making river tables and things, um, if I have a pattern, let's say that I'm, I've, got, I've got a vector that I'm cutting a pocket out uh, of a certain pattern and everything, and I'm going to end up dropping a piece of glass into this pocket, I can take my design file and export it out as a PDF, and I can send that PDF over to the glass company and they can cut the piece of glass uh, to match my size. Uh, so it's a perfect fit and drop in. And we didn't have the ability to export as a PDF until the more recent uh, versions of the software. I believe it was it was either nine or 9.5 and 10. We now have the ability to export as a PDF. Uh, before that, uh, it wasn't one of the options, but now it is. Let's take a moment and let's uh, answer some questions here. So, Mike jumps in and says, would you explain what the use vector start points and use vector selection order is and what are the advantages of using this? Absolutely. Mike, and by the way, this is a great question. Um, let's take this project here, this game project that I have, and let's get Mike's question off there. So Mike's question is, is can you explain what the use vector start points and use vector selection. Uh, like if I was in a profile toolpath, under the profile toolpath, we usually see in our order here, vector selection orders. That means use vector selection order. Um, and the use start points, start at, keep current start points or optimize start points, and our profile toolpath, they're kind of located in this area here. If you don't see ramps, leads, orders, start at, and corners, then you need to check off the box. And let's maximize this screen for you guys. And let's also, let me change my view so my everything is nice and big for you like it always is. So stand by a second. Let me change my display settings here. <clears throat> I think that's what I use toy. All right, and let's uh, let's bring that screen back up. Ooh, yeah, that's nice and big for you. All right, hey Dave, how you doing, bud? All right, so once again, in the Vetric software, and let's let me hide this uh, branding here for a moment. Bear with me a second. Uh, let me turn off my brand. Hide that for a second. In a profile toolpath, uh, if you're not seeing uh, these ramps, leads, order, and start at in corners and things, uh, then you need to come up to the top here and check off show advanced option, you know, toolpath options, and that will you know show them and everything. But what Mike is talking about now in the profile toolpath, those two items that he was referring to, the vector selection order and the start points, that's located down here in the order and start at. But if we go and look at other toolpaths, let's say the V-carve toolpath, as you're progressing through the V-carve toolpath, you're going to see these two options here. Use vector start points, use vector selection order. What this simply means, uh, Mike and everybody, is if I need uh, my design to cut in a certain order and I select, okay, I want this to cut first, then I want this to cut second, and this to cut third, then if I use that vector selection order, it's going to carve in the order that I selected those vectors. And the advantage of that is, is there are sometimes um, when, uh, I'll give you a, a classic example. 
on this project and my other sign projects and all, I will usually carve three or four files at a time. And the I will carve three or four files at a time and welcome them all. Uh, and signs at a time. And I want the job to carve this board first before it carves the next board and before it carves the next board. So I can select all the vectors on that board, then select all the vectors on the next board, so on and so forth. And if I use the vector selection order, it's going to carve that one sign first, then move to the next board, the next sign, and on and on. So that's use the vector selection order. It'll carve in the order that you select vectors. Now, use vector start points. This is, if we look at a vector, if we go into node editing and we look at a vector, the green node is your start point on the vector, okay? And what this is saying is use those start points. So basically, if I was carving these designs, my start point here, the VBIT or the end mill, whatever would be carving, would start here, come around, finish, and then it would move over to this start point, come around and finish, move over to this start point, come over and finish. Now, if you don't use the vector start points, then it's going to optimize the tool path to where it's going to cut the shortest distance. So when it starts the cut, when it moves over to the next vector, it's going to move to the shortest distance point to start the next cut. This is going to kind of minimize your runtime or reduce your runtime some. If it has to jump from this start point all the way over to this start point here and, and on and on, then that's going to add a little bit of time, that extra motion you don't need. So sometimes use vector start points are uh, important, but most times it's not, unless there's a specific reason that you need it to start on that cut. And where that would come into play is if I am doing a lead in and a lead out where my bit is starting somewhere and then cutting in like a little ramp into the cut, and I don't want that to happen on the corner, I wanna happen in the middle of my vector, then most likely I'm going to end up creating a point there and I'm gonna change that point to my start point. If it'll let me, bear with me a second here, let's insert one, work with me. We'll make that a start point. And then if I choose to use that start point, then my lead in will start here cut around to this point and lead out. And usually on that sidewall, that's going to give me a little bit cleaner cut than if I was starting on a corner or something like that. So that's where use vector start points will come in handy. All right, everybody. Well, uh, I believe Burl Tishner is uh, here with us. Let's go ahead and uh, pop him on the screen for a minute. Welcome, bro. How are you doing? We're doing fine. Sorry that uh, right, bro. didn't get to join you. Check your start. microphone because I don't have any sound for you. No sound. Let me check here. <laughs> Let's see if that's be. Uh, no, sir. I sure don't hear you. Let's see if I can help you out from that. It shows I've got it on and it shows that I'm uh, here. You fine. <laughs> Sorry. Look at everybody. Can you hear me? Pearl, down at the bottom of your screen, you should have cam and mic option, yep. little gear looking icon. If you click on that, uh, click on audio on the window that pops up. The camera and, and make audio, sure that yes. your audio is set to the correct microphone default. You should see little green dots moving when you're talking. Yes. Is that any better? Hello, testing one, two, three. It is going up and down. It is. The green light is going up and down. But, uh, okay, he's hearing audio, but I'm not hearing him. So you guys, are you guys? Uh, are you here, Hello. Burl? You hear both? Okay, so we can hear you. Can okay, sorry, Hello. Burl. They can hear you, but I can't. Hear you. <laughs> Maybe so, it's your uh, your speaker. You uh, don't have yours on there. That's on. That's mm -hmm. my issue. It's on my end. Let me uh, find oh, out what's anyhow. My audio. You check your your speakers uh, on that. So. <laughs> that was on me. All, All right. right. Well, sorry about being late, everyone. Um, Laney and I were trying a new thing. <laughs> You can definitely hear that. 
Hello? Almost there, guys and girls. This is the first time Burl is joining us. Well, isn't that something? All right. Well, Burl, evidently everybody can hear you. So uh, introduce yourself, and um, I'm going to do my best to uh, read get lips over here and just. <laughs> well, one of the things that uh, I've asked Laney to do, and um, is. Obviously, a lot of us can't get out and, you know, our shows are canceled and stuff like that. So we're in some new territory and we'd like to get and allow people to, um, you know, do some stuff online. And we thought about doing some collaborations of uh, um, some different things that we could do together, uh, kind of like a show type of a thing and showing products and stuff like that. So we wanted to jump on together and it looks like we need to work on our technical uh, difficulties here and getting all these things worked out. Um, so I appreciate you letting me jump on and uh, saying hi to everybody. We're doing good here. Show seasons have been phenomenal for us this year. I've had really good sales and um, um, we're still busy here. So, um, you know, obviously this is a hiccup in everybody's life, um, but, uh, you know, we'll get through it and, and uh, do, do well there. So we're, we're doing good. Digital Woodcarver is. And um, on that, I forgot to, uh, uh, my background here, everybody gets to see my family and all my pictures that I have. That's behind my desk there. So Good thing they're I all down up from that uh, uh, picture there. But uh, Lenny, are you still uh, not uh, being able to hear us? I take it. All right. I Unfortunately, for some reason, guys and girls, I cannot hear Burl. Yeah. And I'm not sure okay. what is happening with that. Uh, give me a second and let me turn on my exterior audio and that might help. Yeah. Go ahead. Can you hear me now? And, and sir, you know, we can, okay. we can let, um, you know, Lanny do, do some more training there, uh, work out all these little, little details, but, uh, wanted to play with, uh, uh, doing this, a uh, live stream where we can do, can you hear me now? I can hear you. Okay. Is it blowing out your eardrums? Now we can't hear you. You're muted. So. I had the wrong set of speakers on, so sorry about that. Okay. Now you can hear me? I sure can. Yeah, and I was telling everybody we was trying to do a collaboration here. Um, with the show season doing well and, and cancellation of shows, we're looking at some uh, doing some collaboration where both you and I um, and some other things that we can uh, um, do some presentations where, you know, people would otherwise not be able to do. So we're still brainstorming on those and um, still looking at user meetings this year. But obviously this uh, hiccup where, you know, we can't, uh, you know, get together and have meetings and, and all that. Um, is is making it tough, but uh, we'll figure it out. Um, but uh, Laney invited me to join this one, kind of see how it works, and uh, so we'll we'll certainly do that. But uh, yeah, and, Lane, uh, for those uh, of you that you know may not know, um, Digital Woodcarver has been around since 2009, and I had the pleasure of joining them in uh, 2015, late 2014, 2015. Yeah. And uh, it's been a it's been a wonderful ride ever since. And and this is usually our show season. And with everything going on, we've kind of gotten uh, yeah, eliminated. But, um, well, and I was telling them we've done very well to shows this year. Um, and we do have uh, if you noticed our website being a little different, we've got a marketing guy that's helping us working with Laney and myself in doing some different things. A young young gentleman that's uh, very energetic and trying to give us a, the new and improved look but um and we're working with all different avenues as we can um but certainly this uh the travel or the you know meeting bands uh we didn't we were actually on our way to columbus ohio show when we were it was canceled and they started closing it and then pretty well all the shows that we had clear out till may even the ones in may have been closed so we're looking at doing some things uh, in between um we're not going anywhere and certainly want to be able to reach out to our customers and with technology and allowing us to, you know, do it online. Um, 
what I'm finding is, is a lot of people are kind of in, in the same boat that everybody else is. We're kind of stuck in our house or confined to areas. Um, and it's a good time where you can get some training, um, get updated on, on some uh, things that uh, we can do, uh, you know, um, as they say, make uh, lemonade out of some lemons that we got here. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, if any of you have any questions for Burl or anything uh, with regards to uh, Digital Wood Carver or uh, future plans or uh, our equipment, absolutely uh, ask those. Uh, I just invited Burl out uh, tonight to kind of do a little bit of a Q&A with you guys and girls, uh, and um, but also show him what uh, StreamYard is about because we may be able to use this platform uh, to make... Uh, as Bruce said, make a, you know a, a a virtual show, if you will, uh, to um, kind of uh, give you guys and girls something to uh, attend uh, and with our broadcast. And we may, if we work out the details and all, it may be a regular thing uh, that we can yeah. do uh, each week and stuff. Um, now, Burl is the mastermind behind. Uh, the digital wood carver units, uh, and um, for those of you that are not digital wood carver owners um everybody's welcome here you know of course we just teach vetric uh software here and all but for those of you that are not digital wood carver owners uh we do have uh, uh four units right now possibly a fifth one coming down the road down the pike uh but currently on the market uh, we do have our mini carver uh unit it is our small unit our benchtop unit 18 by 24. um and then we have our uh 2440 models which is our standard model and we, it comes in a three and a four axis uh version uh and for those of you uh that you know for the fourth axis um basically what that allows for is being able to do nice turnings and spindles and table legs and statues and things now from there we do have we're hoping one day to have kind of a hybrid unit uh, before we jump into the commercial line uh, but from our 2440, we do have our 4x4 machine, uh, which is our kind of, we call it our commercial line uh, unit, which has a 48x48 48 48 cutting area. Uh, and then we have our 4x8 machine, which is our monster. Uh, but hopefully there's going to be one down the road that is kind of a hybrid between that 2440 and that 4x4, uh, giving us a nice midline uh, unit Hey, Lane. down the road. Yes, sir. Just a quick, uh, I'm getting, seeing some of the live comments. How do I respond to those or is that not, uh, am I not? You can it? down at the bottom of the screen, there's a post a comment where you can type in or you can just answer the question out loud. Uh, if you see a comment, you can actually hover your mouse over and click on it and you can have it show on the screen for everybody and then you can respond to it that way. Well, that's not allowed me to, to do anything with it. All right, so let's see know. here. Um, yeah. All right. By the way, um, so here's a couple. A of... Oh, there. All right. Yes. So I'll throw it up there. Uh, we've got, uh, how do I stop the laser going up and down during a burn? Well, you change, if it's the, if you're referring to the six watt laser for the digital wood carver, uh, it's in your Vetric post processor. Uh, you want to make sure you're using the digital wood carver laser post processor, but also at the same time, your cut depth should be zero when you're calculating the tool path. It doesn't move up and down like a router, so zero for the cut depth. And also your home start position needs to be set uh, where your safe Z heights and everything are at zero and your start points at zero. And uh, I'll, we'll, we'll circle back to that and I'll show you when we're in the software. Um, Burl, you want to take... Uh, no, as far as, yeah, uh, the, the one that I wanted to respond to real quick, Ed, uh, just to give you an update. Your machine is uh, actually shipped out today. So it is on its way to Laney. And then you and Laney will work out the details on when you get that. So I uh, apologize. It has been, uh, show season has been crazy, but uh, it is uh, actually as of today. So this is, uh, um, um, it, it went to the freight company. And generally that's uh, three days, isn't it, Laney, to you? Two to yes, three days? three days. Yep. So, Ed, yes, I got the call today that the unit was shipped out and it's on the way and then I'll be delivering it to you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. 
Now, you guys and girls up above that ask questions and everything, do not worry. I'm going to get back to you. Okay. Um, we and just you can tell Janet, uh, or, or uh, yeah, Janet, uh, we've already talked. I talked to her today, and um, it was shipped out at the same time. So, um, yeah, she, she's and, all excited about that, too. So, absolutely. Um, and uh, conversation with Janet. Burl, from what I understand, uh, you and I uh, and Jake are possibly going to come up with some promotions for upcoming to kind of uh, battle yep. some of these uh, show closures and things like that. For exactly. People. Exactly. So, guys and girls, keep an eye out for that. Uh, you'll most likely yep. see posts on Facebook on the Digital Woodcarver Facebook page, uh, the Digital Woodcarver website for those promotions and things. Uh, there could be some, you know, some good deals uh, to be had. Uh, don't know what they are yet, so we're not gonna, you know, uh, presume. Yeah, let's get out by you know. And uh, then we've got uh, uh, exciting things that are coming ahead with regards to, you know, these these. Everybody's been wanting me to get out in the shop and and show the products and and how to do this and how to do that. And we might be able to set those up in a live stream. Uh, we're talking yeah. about that, uh, Burl. Uh, John Amon's got a question. Uh, let's see if we, one of us can tackle that one. We never talk about the CO2 lasers on your website. Are they available? And what software, software do we use? Um, yeah, John, um, they're very good machines. Uh, we don't talk about it a lot because our core product is our CNC routers. That's what we manufacture and um, sell the most of. Um, I will, our CO2 lasers are, we're a reseller for those. So those are not something that we produce. But because they match up or align with our product very well, people ask me all the time, you know, uh, you know, should I buy a laser or should I buy a CNC router? Um, there's a lot of things that they do together or meaning that they both can do. But certainly each one of them have its advantages. Of course, you know, um, being that we are focused on the CNC router part, I think there's a lot more we can do, meaning a variety of things. But the CO2 lasers, they're very, very good. Um, I see Dave commented that he he loves his. Um, and like I say, there is areas that they shine. Um, you take like acrylic plastics, um, the laser just, you know, cutting out or doing some, reducing frosting on that um, compared to the CNC, um, you know, doing that type of work, the, the CO2 um, um, lasers do well. Um, and it sounds like, or it looks like we've got a lot of customers that have our units. Um, we should promote it a, a little more. Um, as far as how hard and what software to use, um, you can actually use a VCarve Pro um, as far as doing your your outlines, your your vectors and stuff like that, um, especially if you're very familiar with that. Um, you can do it in VCarve Pro. It has its own software where you actually control. And the way lasers work, that's a little bit different than the CNC routers is you basically have control of your speed and the power of that laser. So the slower you go with the laser and the higher the power, the deeper it will burn um, in your cuts. So if you're doing a, um, you know, where you're just making a contrast, making it black in a, in a light wood, um, you know, you if you want that to go deeper, you would basically turn up your power or turn, a, turn down your speed. Um, and then, then if you want to cut clear through, if it's a material that's you're able to cut clear through, um, you, you slow it way down and it allows it to burn more in that area. Um, the software, uh, you know, like I say, you can do the artwork and clean up in your V-Carve Pro, Aspire, all that, especially if that's what you're familiar with. And then you'll actually take it in the controller software and you have a little bit of control with, you know, if you want to fill in an area or do an outline, and you can take different lines and give them different colors so that you can change even in the same drawing or same artwork. You can do different powers. Um, so if you want to outline a shape or fill it in and then still cut the whole shape out once you're done, you can set in. It's kind of like a layer where you can turn different, different artwork or different parts of the artwork, different colors, and then set those parameters for those individual uh, colors but you know the lasers work uh, good uh, the ones we got out there looks like we got a good group uh, that have um, um, you know have lasers um, on their machine um, yeah. the, the six watt is a little different than the co2 lasers 
Um, let me explain uh, just a little bit of difference between the one we offer for the CNC router and then the one that's a standalone, that's the CO2 lasers. Um, in the name in themselves, you know, a six watt laser and our larger ones are 60 or 90 watts. And we've actually got some out there that are 100 and 150 watt lasers. Um, that in itself tells you a lot. And Burl, mm -hmm. we have a 60 and a 90. Uh, right, that, that we correct. currently that we yep. can, yeah we offer carry and stuff yes. and then of course our six watt attaches to our, di our digital wood carver yeah unit. but um, the the one that mounts to our machine is a diode laser it's a very small unit that fits there and I call it a wood burner meaning that you can you can basically burn on the wood uh, one of the cool things with laser because it comes to a focal point it's a very detailed line that you can get in your material um, when it comes to that. Um, as far as difference wise, uh, otherwise, um, you know, between the, the small one and the, and the large one, uh, mainly it's going to be your power. Um, the small one we do not have, um, as of the moment, uh, Vetric is still working on it, and Lanny help me if I misspeak uh, here, but don't have the shading as far as getting from gray to yeah the gray white to black side. yeah gradient in there they are still working with that where the co2 lasers their software does have some of that built in um, yeah. that you can do some and, of those photographs uh by the way this is a user project dave garbett just sent it over and uh yeah. the letters and the text are v carved and the deer scene uh is laser cut uh over yeah. there so you can see that with the six volt with the laser um uh, Dave, let me know if that was the six watt laser or your other laser machine that did that. Uh, Vetric announced a couple of years ago that they're that at a, one of their user conference that they are working on a laser add on. Uh, it'll probably be somewhere around the hundred ninety nine dollar range or, or you know ninety nine dollar range. I don't know where they haven't come up with it yet. But if you noticed in your Vetric software, um, if you've noticed that these tools such as the Open Picture Editor and the crop bitmap these tools are kind of a prelude to um the laser add-on that they're getting ready to uh come out with now they're still working on it but uh to um turn into those grayscales and invert this is going this is kind of when they brought out 10 and 9.5 they, oh, yeah. they were leaning towards that new laser add-on that they're you know uh, working towards and they're adding the tools necessary for that. That's, so that's why you see a lot of these tools in here and wonder, what are those used for exactly? Uh, and things within your Vetric software. And I will, Lanny, uh, I seen a question that popped up about switching back and forth. Our six watt laser that we put on there, if people are not familiar with that, it's a, it's a unit that actually mounts to the head. So you wouldn't use your router at the same time as that laser, but it can be, you can go back and forth you know, use uh, the CNC router and then attach this um, uh, laser, the six watt laser, turn your router off, run the laser part of it. So it can go back and forth. And, and what it takes to change it out is less than a, you know, couple minutes. I mean, two thumb screws and a plug in the unit. Uh, it's very quick to change on and off. You do have to change some things in your settings. Um, number one, you know, what you're, you're running, you have to use the laser tool. And then also it's very, very important that you have the post processor yes. that's set up for laser. Otherwise you'll get these lines that goes from, um, your different letters or different, uh, different outlines. And right. And like that's that. one of the, we guys, what we're going to be talking about in the Vetric software about those issues that people are still having is that switching back and forth between post processors. When uh, I have uh, customers call me, say, hey, my router is just not raising up. It's cutting lines. It's moving from one place to another cutting line. Uh, when we go and look at their software, uh, we find out that they are still using the laser processor, post processor from when the, they were doing their laser job earlier that week or that day or something. So you have to be able to switch back and forth. Um, and uh, for those of you, uh, Roger, stick with us. Uh, you asked about making a rosette uh, here in a little bit. We're going to get back into the software, and uh, we'll do that for sure. Um, let's see here. Okay. Uh, I'm going to just throw this up. Just a very nice comment from Dave. Uh, yeah. It says, you can't go wrong with their laser. It's awesome. Uh, he used Artyworks, and then he moved to Lightburn. And I just want to give a little bit of a touch-up on Lightburn. 
uh, we the, the machines that we uh, sell, the laser machines we sell, come with RD8 Works. Uh, Lightburn is a third-party uh, laser software out there, and it's very much compatible with our lasers. And not only that, it's also compatible with our uh, six-watt laser on our machine as well, too. Uh, Lightburn is uh, has a little bit um, much more user-friendly uh, interface, um, if you will. It's a little bit more streamlined, uh, but same kind of feel and function of RD8 works. Uh, we don't promote or sell or have any, uh, you know, uh, um, um, any relationship with Lightburn. Uh, they're just uh, what a lot of our customers are using uh, instead of the default RD8 works that come with it, uh, because Lightburn is uh, a lot more, a little bit more versatile, uh, and it does have some functions. Now, one of the main things that people always ask me is, has anybody ever carved a picture yet? And aside from the deer scene that you see in this photo here, they're talking about grayscale imaging, you know, laser imaging and stuff. I have not attempted that yet or anything. And that's what I'm hoping that Vetric software will be able to allow us to do. Uh, right now, um, in our larger lasers, our 60 watt and our 90 watt, we can absolutely do that. We can work with those grayscales and those files that we uh, uh, edit in Photoshop or within the RD8 works itself. Uh, but right now the Vetric doesn't have that capability. And so six watt laser, it's capable of doing it. Right. And that's what I was going to say. That resource just yet, you know, as far as, and, or, or maybe it's just, we don't have the know-how because I haven't, you know, I haven't even tried it myself to uh, be able to in, extra instruct on how it goes. Um, now uh, Let's, uh, so even uh, Todd Roop, Todd Roop is a laser customer of ours. He switched to Lightburn as well. And uh, I know a lot of you guys and girls, uh, you know, you join Spindle TV uh, to, you know, for the classes and lessons. Don't worry. We're just doing a quick Q&A with Burl Tishner. Uh, I'm going to get back to the Vetric and I will answer those questions that you guys and girls had. But uh, I really wanted to take the advantage of having him here. And if anybody wants to, you know, rapid fire any questions to him that uh, about Digital Woodcarver, about the product, yeah. anything that he might be able to answer. Let's take a few minutes and do that uh, because Burl does. Uh, we'll have to get back to production here shortly. <laughs> yeah. yeah, got some uh, some other machines to get out uh, this evening. It's been a crazy week in time, but uh, appreciate it. Um, and Lanny, we need to do this more often. Uh, I get so busy. I need to. Um, uh, I I don't. I love and enjoy doing it. Um, it just uh, my time schedule is um, very limited when it comes to that. But I would say. If you don't mind, just give me a reminder, and I don't mind. I'd love doing Q and A questions and and time. Um, you know, maybe we can do this once a maybe once a month. We'll pick a you know a time where I can jump in and do a little Q and A. And sometimes uh, customer feedbacks are very very important. Over the years, there's been I couldn't tell you all the different ones. Um, whether it's you give feedback to Laney and he passed it along, or directly to me. Um, either way, we we've done well. Um, and, and there's been a lot of improvements from customer feedback. So, yeah, absolutely. Okay. And, uh, Mama, Mama Bryn, um, will you be doing any shows uh, closer to Nebraska by chance? Everything is so far from you guys up there. Uh, and um, right <laughs> now, shows are kind of yeah. We we're not doing any show right at the moment. Unfortunately, yeah, it's a little, uh, it's a little so, tough to say that. But bro, yeah, I'm. Yeah. I don't have a map in front of me, and I'm so terrible. <laughs> you don't even know where Nebraska is, probably, Lenny. But probably not. Anyway. No, uh, I mean, that's how far I miss a lot of that stuff. But are we? Do we even do any shows in that <laughs> in that neck of the woods? <laughs> uh, the closest we'd get out there would be Kansas City. Um, they okay. keep talking about doing one in Denver. Um, you know, it's just tough for us. Uh, you guys are obviously in a in an area that you know it's rural, spread out a little bit more, and that gets to be tough. Uh, Jerry, always love seeing and hearing from you. Um, you and your your wife there. Hopefully, you guys are doing fine. I, I enjoy seeing customers and getting feedback. I'm looking at all the names over here. You know, Tippy and and Dave and and Todd. Um, I always like uh, hanging out with you guys and and seeing you guys. Um, but yeah, uh, let's let's uh, try to do it um, once in a while. We'll do a Q and A. If you don't have any more questions, um, all right, guys. Uh uh, right now is the chance. I know there's a slight delay between uh, what Burl and I are seeing and what you're seeing. So uh, let's give it uh, another 60 seconds if you guys want to start typing any questions. If not, then we're going to go ahead and get back to our design. Yeah, give the class and then I'll leave you guys. 
looks like Lanny, just to give you an update, why they're throwing anything's um, out there. Um, this looks uh, um, looks like a uh, good format, and I think we can do what we was talking about earlier um, yes. interaction and do some. Uh, I'd love to do some uh, uh, virtual shows uh, for for the people that don't, and then uh, maybe even do some like interim type of uh, user meeting type things. So yeah. And, uh, and Debbie, uh, what Debbie's referring to for those of you that are not digital cover customers is uh, th about three times a year we have a users owner meeting uh, where we go out to different locations and our users come for some live uh, training and stuff. And this with this year, uh, we are planning later in the year for those user groups. But uh, Burl and I are also talking about actually doing virtual uh, owners group meetings uh, to where uh, for those that can't come out to the shows where we can do them uh, live online and uh, in this type of format stuff. So that, that would Debbie, we're always looking to go out west. I know uh, we've kind of not got out in the Kansas City, um, uh, St. Louis area out there. Hopefully, we'd like to do three this year. Um, basically, you know, over the last week, uh, two weeks, I uh, kind of throwed everything into a uh, turmoil. Um, so we'll just have to see how the um, um, the rest of the year goes. Uh, love to do it. Want to do a little bit different formats, um, meaning that. Um, um, you know, looking at if we do a two day, day and a half, maybe set it up for, you know, beginners to, um, um, you know, advanced and different levels on that. So Lenny and I have been in conversations. Um, just once this kind of craziness settles down, we'll kind of get back into, um, there should be a questionnaire we've been talking about sending out and getting people's feedback on the user meetings. I will tell you, if any of you have done the, uh, user meetings, um, we have a blast. Um, you know, it's a good um, time to get together. But what I love is seeing our customers come with those um, creative things they've come up with that uh, the rest of us like, oh, that is so cool. Never would have thought of that. And then once you see it, it's, uh, um, you know, you, you see that it's not that complicated that you can do that too. So absolutely. Lenny, well, I think I'm going to take off. Here that, uh, you know, are uh, good. They're happy to see you. Uh, they're, you know, they, they're stuck seeing me every week and everything. So they're happy <laughs> to see you come out and, uh, and, and hear from you and everything. Yeah. Uh, I really appreciate you taking the time. I know how busy you guys are over there. And, and by the way, uh, uh, congratulations, uh, to digital wood carver guys, uh, they're, we're growing. And, uh, what do we have now? 13 on staff, uh, at the uh, it's 12. There's, uh, 12. there's 12 of us, um, that's going and, uh, it's kind of scary. One of the things that we, we're going to do when we do these, what we call virtual shows, is show our, show our manufacturing area because people haven't seen what we do. It is out in the middle of uh, the country or boondocks, right, Lane? Right. Um, you can get there from here. Um, but it's actually some pretty amazing. Um, uh, we just put in a new piece of equipment like three weeks ago, um, a new brake press. So we've got some awesome pieces of equipment. We're going to do some virtual, um, you know, show sure. but also of our sure. manufacturing, the assembly area, some of the guys down there and some of the machining centers, turning centers and the powder coat booth, the laser we got. And uh, yeah, guys, we make everything in house now. Uh, and it's, it's very cool. The, 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 from when I joined uh, in 2015, really, that's kind of my official join date, if you will, uh, to now the, it's been, it's all thanks to you. Thanks to all of you, uh, you know, that, that are, have, uh, supported digital wood carver and yeah. supported, uh, you know, uh, us by purchasing products and everything. And it's amazing yeah. to see, and we're hoping to show you some of that. Maybe it's, it's, it's kind of like a, not, not necessarily like a show and tell, if you will, uh, just kind of a show you uh, where we're coming from and what we're doing, uh, yeah. as well as just informing you. So, you know, what are, you know, what to expect when you purchase a digital wood carver, if you do, or, uh, and yep. things like this. I'm looking forward to those type of things, Burl. I really appreciate you, uh, yep. joining me tonight and, and everything. And, um, yeah, we definitely have to do it again. Uh, love to have you yep. again. Well, uh, guys and, and ladies and gentlemen, um, you know, it, it's crazy. We've never seen kind of times like this, but I want to encourage everybody from digital woodcarver side. We're obviously, uh, well, we want to be safe and we want you guys to be safe. 
um, you know, in, in the, you know, getting around people and stuff. Um, hopefully all of you are doing whatever precautions uh, necessary on that, but uh, we'll get through it. And um, it was good uh, hanging out with you guys. So, yeah. Maybe if you tell me how to get off here or just kick me off. Uh, it's very well. simple. I'm just going to go ahead and, and uh, we'll talk to you guys. See you hopefully. In the I can take care of it from here. Uh, everybody, we're going to say goodbye to Burl. Yeah. Burl, thanks a lot, bud. And I'm going to go ahead and remove you from the stream. All right. All right. We're back. Thank you, Burl, for that. Uh, I appreciate you uh, very much. All right. And, uh, let me let me let me bring Burl back. Well, he might still be able to hear me. Burl, if you can still hear me, give me a thumbs up. They they don't see you, but they can hear me. Uh, they can hear you, but or they can't see. You. Okay, all you have to do is close your web browser now. I, you're out of the stream, so all you have to do is close your web browser and all that good stuff. All right, guys and girls, I want to thank you. Now, George Planick, you had a question about Probe. Let me go back up, and we got to answer some questions uh, that were up higher before Burl uh, popped in. I really appreciate him for taking the time. Uh, to do that. And I really appreciate all of you for sticking through and, uh, you know, asking some questions and, and saying hi to him and everything. That is the owner of Digital Woodcarver. Uh, and uh, he is, uh, you know, um, uh, he's been a blessing in my life and, uh, uh, you know, makes a great machine. And, and I'm just, you know, happy to be, you know, associated with him uh, in every aspect of the word. All right, uh, let's kind of, uh, I'm going to come back up and let's answer some questions here. Let's get past all the, I went all the way too far to the hellos. Hello, hello, hello. Um, let's see. Um, Tippy's first question was, uh, hey, what's what's the going rate for a case of TP? <laughs> okay, we'll leave that question alone. Um, all right, Mike Smith, make sure that I answered your question enough to understand about those uh, select vector selection orders and stuff uh, and um, uh, the vector start points. So let me know uh, in the comments uh, if we did. And Charles, uh, hopefully you're still with us here. Charles, uh, how do you move a tool database to another computer? And that's a great question, how to move the tool database to another computer, because uh, sometimes your computer may crash or you just might have, you know, the Vetrix software installed on another PC uh, and you want to make sure that your tool databases match. That's very important that they match uh, and everything. So uh, if we go into the tool database here, uh, in version 10, uh, you have the ability to upload your tool database to your customer portal, your VNCO account in Vedric, and then you can actually download it from that portal onto another computer. So that's one way. Uh, in older software and even in the VCarve 10, you can export the selected tool or group. Okay. So let's say that I come in here and I select the group of Imperial tools and I come in here and export that tool group. So when I click on export the tool group, uh, it's going to create a VTDB uh, vetric uh, tool database file. And I'll just call this my, um, I'll call it my uh, iTools. Okay. And let's throw this on my desktop. And uh, let's throw that in the class file folder here. And I'll just call it my tools. So now hit save. All right, so I've got that saved. I can save it on a flash drive, uh, what have you, you know, get it on a flash drive, take it over to the other computer. In the other computer, uh, I can open up, uh, import that tool, open up my tool database, and I can click on import a tool database. Uh, I can click on that import, find that my tool VTDB, uh, click on import, and it's going to ask me, hey, do you want to import? merge with no overriding or merge overriding the um what's currently in there and in my case it's the same tool right so i would merge that uh and uh have it overwrite you know what's already there uh if you have uh current tools in your other computer tool database that you use and you're trying to just make sure they match then you want to merge no overriding and here, hold on a second. Duh, Laney. Let's back up a little bit. Let's get Charles' question off there and let's back up and hit cancel and let's undo everything that I just did because none of you saw what I just did. 
And of course, I'm sure y'all were hollering at me down in the screen below going, hey, 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 we can't see you. But I didn't see that because I was still up, scrolled up on the questions and all. All right, let's start over again. Uh, in our tool database here, uh, we can, um, if we're connected uh, in version 10, if we're connected to our VNCO account, then we have the ability to upload our tool database to our Vetric VNCO account. And then we could download it on another computer. Or down here, we have export, selected tool or group, and import selected tool or group. So what I did was I selected on my Imperial tools here and I exported them out. Uh, and I saved them as my tools, VTDB. I uh, hit save, I'll replace that file. And now I take that file over to my other computer uh, and then we'll come into import tool database. And when I import this tool database, I'm gonna have the option of importing it, which it will read the tools uh, under the selected group and basically just kind of import them in. Merge with no overriding. Merge will uh, merge the incoming groups with what's currently in that tool database. If overriding, okay, right here, merge, overriding. If overriding, uh, the cutting data uh, for matching tool geometry will overwrite uh, the matching material and machine data. Otherwise, it will create a copy. Okay, so basically it'll overwrite what's in there. And in my case, um, I'm going to merge and overwrite, you know, so it's not the same. And then when I do, you know, all of my tools will be in there. Okay, so um, if I had, uh, let's say that I take and delete that out of there. Let's say I didn't have that tool database in there and all. And then I come in here and import that in. Okay, I would just click import. And what it's going to do is it's going to throw it in the metric right there. It always does. So then I'm going to take that and I'm actually going to drag it up so it's above the metric. And uh, there's all my tools right there. Okay. All right. So uh, very simple. You have your export here to export out of the tool database that you want, to export out of the version you want. And then you can import it into the other computer's software. Okay. Now, back to our comments, and uh, guys, uh, there was a lot scrolling through, uh, so bear with me a second here. Um, John uh, Withrow said, uh, why is it when uh, I look at my tool database, it is not the same for each toolpath? Profile has all the tools, and then I open vCarve, and the tools aren't there. Well, John, this is the software's way of showing you what tools you can and what tools you cannot use with that particular toolpath. And what John's referring to here is a profile toolpath. I can use any type of tool with a profile toolpath. Okay. Any type of tool, V-bit, end mill, dovetail bit, keyhole bit, you name it, I can use that with a profile toolpath. But if I'm trying to calculate a V-carve toolpath, then I go to select that tool where my V-bit is. Now my tool database is limited. It's only going to show me the tools that I can use with that. Now in the main tool, I can either use a V-bit or a ball nose bit. Okay. But in my clearance tools, if I close this in my clearance tools and I select, I can use you know, all the types of bits again. So it's showing you what tools you can and what tools you can't use with that particular toolpath, John. That's why um, that's why you're only seeing certain tools when you're in a certain toolpath. So hopefully that answered your question. All right, Roger, uh, Roger had a cool question here. It says, uh, can you show how to make a rosette for a window or door trim three by three? And uh, let's take a moment and do that. Um, there's a lot of ways of uh, making rosettes and things. And uh, so uh, let's go ahead and I'm going to draw a three by three rectangle here. All right, <clears throat> three inch by three inch rectangle there. Now, uh, most rosettes, uh, you know, some general rosettes and all, you have uh, a variety of different uh, profiles. Uh, some could have a three dimensional carving or something in there. 
uh, and, and, and things like that. Um, but generally, uh, the rosettes will have a variety of kind of uh, like almost round uh, round overs, if you will. And let's let's see if we can pull up a picture of a rosette um, uh, uh, for uh, for a piece of uh, wood trim, just to give you guys a little bit of a, an example of what I'm referring to here. <clears throat> All right, so um, that's not the one I wanted. Bear with me. Let's grab, I'll grab two of them, uh, two samples here, and let's pull that over onto the screen. All right, so we could have a, a very simple uh, rosette, such as what you see on this corner block here. Uh, very simple rosette here. Uh, you could have a more decorative uh, style rosette that has, you know, a type of uh, V carving, if you will, in it. Uh, and things, um, they can have different, uh, uh, tile, you know, diameters or outlines and things. And uh, so let's, uh, let's make one of those real quick. All right. Just to give you guys a visual of what was, uh, what I was referring to. All right. So basically, Depending on um, what uh, design uh, that I'm going for, uh, generally this is going to be a profile toolpath. So let's get out of the that, or it could also be a molding toolpath. I'll show you how to make it as a piece of molding as well. Uh, but let's say let's say I was using a roundover bit to create that. Um, you could even use a rosette bit if you wanted to, uh, and basically it's just turn it on and cut. Uh, but let's let's do it as we if we were cutting and everything. Um, I'm gonna go a quarter of an inch deep, and let's select the tool. Now I'm gonna use the white side 2050 roundover bit, um, and if I were to uh, let's see, let's go on the let's go on the outside of the line for this one and let's calculate that and preview that cut uh, you'll see that we end up with you know something similar to that right there uh, probably need to go down just a little bit deeper so I get more of a dome shape um, or make this one smaller uh, let's follow that by uh, this one here and of course, you know, you would probably have uh, larger, you know, diameter bits. Uh, I'm just using, you know, a uh, an eighth inch roundover, so it's a very small roundover, but uh, give you the idea. Um, this will just give you the idea. <clears throat> bum, 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 bum. Uh, so uh, let's do a final cut. Now, of course, you could draw your lines and all better. A bigger radius bit will give you, it will, you won't have those flats in the top. They'll be more rounded uh, in things. Uh, so let's go ahead and uh, let's use a quarter inch end mill. And let's cut all the way through. I'm not going to add tabs or anything to this. I'm just going to cut the part out so we can kind of get the general idea uh, and everything. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, that would be kind of a basic rosette, if you will. Um, now, let's look at that, how we would make that if it, we were making it as a, sorry, uh, if we were making it as a piece of molding uh, using the molding toolpath. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, I'm going to create a, let's go with a half inch diameter, 0.5. And I'm going to cut, go into node editing and I'm going to cut that in half. Cut the vector here and on that side, cut the vector there. And I'm going to take that 
top half here. And I could literally, guys, uh, let's let's do this. Let's get rid of this for a minute. And let's move this box over. I don't know. All right. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to... Bum, 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 bum. Bear with me a second. This will make sense in two seconds here. We're going to snap this over to there onto that tangent. Go into node editing and cut the vector there and on that side there. <clears throat> and get rid of that bottom piece. We'll take that and join those two vectors together as one using the join tool. All right, let's say that this was my profile, and let's be more realistic on the size. Right now, it has got a height of uh, 0.6 inches. I'm going to change that down to um, 3.8, so 0.375, and the width by 3 quarters, that'll be fine. Okay, let's go ahead and draw a profile in here uh let's get let's snap to the center of our rectangle wake up there and wake up there i'm hovering the mouse over this rectangle vector so it shows me my center lines and stuff and let's um <clears throat> let's drag that out to here now this being a closed vector, should I should still be able to do it with this toolpath. Uh, we're about to find out because I, I haven't made a rosette this way. Uh, so bear with me a second. Let's select that. Yep. Okay, I can do that. All right. Let's reverse this. Reverse the direction and reverse the direction. Uh, oops. All right. So notice on my circle here, when I select this, uh, my um spikes are shooting outward so what that means is i you know i want them on the inside so what that means for me is is i've got to come down here and i'm going to close this and i'm going to reduce this down to the mid the, the, the smaller size so we'll do that uh because i want that rosette to come out in you know this fashion here and uh i'll use a quarter inch ball nose should be able to fit in there i should be able to have it fit a quarter inch ball nose in there and uh, let's calculate that tool path and if we reset that preview and preview that selected tool path uh, we'll get that nice rounded you know shape here now i'm missing my middle right i need that little that little when it comes up i need it to come over one, one more time to the halfway mark to the halfway mark so uh, when it comes up, I need to round over halfway here. So let's um, let's take and snap to that, and let's pop that over there, and let's size this down much smaller, depending on what we want that middle radius to be. Uh, a little bit smaller. All right, let's pop that over. And zoom into this. I'm going to grab the side and snap right to, to that tangent. I'm going to go into node editing and I'm going to cut the vector up here and over here. Okay, and I'm going to delete that or that circle there. Now I'm going to take this uh, shape here and join those two vectors, which is basically this vector here that I just drew and this one here. Join them together as one, and we're going to go and redo that one more time. We're going to open up that molding toolpath, select our inner circle first, and then our profile. And again, using that quarter inch ball nose, probably an eighth of an inch, but a quarter inch seems fine. We'll do that. And uh, let's reset that preview and preview. See, I'm getting the rounding here, but it's not meeting in the middle. So I may need to uh, make my middle circle let's preview it i need to make my yeah i'm not getting that i'm getting that round over you know here but i'm not getting that center so but you're getting the idea right you're getting the idea hopefully you're getting the idea roger um let's see here i'm, I'm i ended up my flat there 
So let's let's take this object here. Let's stretch it out a bit. And on this, I really need it to hit the middle line for the size of my circle. Uh, that circle is quite big. So I'm actually going to reduce this circle down a little bit more. Probably right about there. And let's try that one more time. Select your circle first, followed by that. And I'm shooting right outside my box there. I stretched it a little bit too far. Let me undo my stretch here. I done stretched it out a little bit too far. <clears throat> I didn't want to shoot outside my box. Let's pull that back in a little bit. All right, one more time. We'll go here and here. All right, that's good for me. Calculate that toolpath. There we go. We're getting closer. And preview the selected toolpath, and we'll get that nice, you know, rosette and then of course we could put a little ball nose in there uh to round that off and how we would do that is we'll take this center circle here um and we'll do a pocket cut we'll select a box core bit let me see what i got for box core bits Uh, I got a three eighth inch radius, three eighth inch diameter. Use the nine sixteenths, and uh, we'll just go down an eighth of an inch. <clears throat> we'll calculate that. Oh, there we go. Kind of create that little center divot probably go down a little bit more but you get the idea roger so hopefully you do um on how to make a rosette let me know if that kind of gives you the idea so we could draw the profile of what we want the rosette to be and then we draw the circle that we want that profile to be swept around so it's taking this middle piece here and it's sweeping it around so it's going to carve that you know over and down and over to create that you know, uh, that rosette part. And that would be a, just a basic rosette. And of course, you can, however you draw your profile, you can get all kinds of different designs and things like that. So great question. Uh, I appreciate that. Uh, but hopefully that kind of showed you a little bit. Um, there, there's a couple of ways of, of, of doing, to approaching that. Okay. And if we look at my my example here versus the example of the rosettes, um, you know, I had the sweep here. I didn't have the little step. You would draw that into the profile. So let me show you here. Let's zoom in on this. All right. So we've got that little sweep over. So it's a more of a pocket there. Uh, they they they. I went down an eighth of an inch. They went down much more there. Um, and uh oops hang on. um but it's more of a dome in the center uh, that's actually not a negative this one's a negative that one's a negative in the middle but this one is more of a dome shape and so with that dome there's a little step out little shallow cut then it rounds over again and then it rounds over again so we would draw those loops we would draw those loops and then just sweep it around with that molding tool path that's a quick way to do it uh and things so if we had a large large enough radius uh round over bit we could uh do that as well too but you got to remember now this groove right here between this middle ring and that ring would be wider if you did it as a round over if you didn't draw the profile and use the profile toolpath or the molding toolpath. I'm so bad at names right now. Molding toolpath. But that'll give you the general idea to kind of get started playing around with that. All right, let's go back up. Um I can't believe uh told Pearl, I said I'll have everything perfect and all and I missed the audio up. I had my speakers on wrong. I couldn't hear a word he was saying. Uh hopefully he talked nice about me. <laughs> All right, let's see here. What do we got? Um that was Roger's question. 
and then everybody said they could hear Burl, and we had that conversation. Let me get back down to the new questions. George Planick. George Planick. Laney, if I recall correctly, a few years ago, I think you did a class on using the digital probe to map a surface. Am I dreaming? Did you? Will you do it once again? Yeah, uh, you're not dreaming. Uh, that's actually in the Spindle TV uh, gallery. Uh, if um, if we were to uh, come in here and uh, go to www.youtube.com and um, isn't that funny that YouTube is taking a while to load? Come on, YouTube. And uh, hey, Spindle TV is live right now. <laughs> That's cool. All right. In the uh, video gallery, George, uh, click on videos when you get to Spindle TV. And um, if you scroll down, you're going to see a screen uh, that has a uh, TNG kind of program in it, the controller program. And if we just keep on scrolling, Keep on scrolling. You're going to find a video that was done a year ago, how to use the digital probe to warp in TNG. And the, uh, the key points of that is are relevant. Uh, but with TNG, uh, Planet CNC, TNG changing and things, uh, some steps have you know, changed or some advances have come out of it. So yes, to answer your question, that was a twofold question. Did I make a video? Yes, I did. How to use the digital probe to warp in TNG? Uh, it's uh, down in the channel section. But uh, are you dreaming? No. And will I do it again? Uh, yes. Um, I will make another video. Uh, there's going to be a couple of videos coming out um, on the new Planet CNC TNG and working with the digital probe. Uh, so hopefully <clears throat> those will be out very soon. Uh, you may, for those of you that are subscribed to Spindle TV, you may notice I've dropped a couple of videos on like how to install your Planet CNC software, how to install your Vetric software. Well, uh, those are kind of preludes up to the uh, videos that I'm going to be doing on uh, how to use the digital laser, how to use the digital probe and things like that. So you'll see those coming uh, soon. Um, let's see here. I'm scrolling down to get answers, guys. Hold on. Let's uh, let's get back here. And once again, thanks a lot, Burl, for joining us. Let's see here. You guys were chatty when Burl was here. Bear with me a second. Let me get down past all this stuff. Okay. All right. <clears throat> How can I create a pocket a quarter inch deep, a quarter inch wide, use a quarter inch end mill and make it move to the right stop, then move to the left to finish the pocket, then move up to the next pocket to do the same? All right, Jeff. That was a tricky question. Let me see here. Let's go in here. <clears throat> How can I create a pocket a quarter inch deep, a quarter inch wide, use a quarter inch end mill? Well, that's not a pocket, that's a drilling operation. If I am doing a quarter inch wide pocket, okay, with a quarter inch end mill, that's a drilling operation with the quarter inch in mill. So let me read the rest of that question. Let me make sure I'm understanding because that's a, how can I create a pocket a quarter inch deep? Drilling tool path, cut depth a quarter of an inch, a quarter inch wide, draw your vector a quarter of an inch. 
five. Um, with a quarter inch end mill. Got that covered. And make it move to right stop, then move to the left to finish the pocket, then move up to the next pocket to do the same. All right, bud. I'm, you lost me on that last part. Uh, I got you this far. Uh, it's a drilling operation as far as a quarter inch wide, quarter inch deep cutting depth with a quarter inch end mill uh, for that quarter inch wide pocket. Um, let me know if that's what you're referring to or if you're referring to an actual, like if you have a series of pockets, let's say this, how you can have it cut a quarter of an inch move to the next pocket cut a quarter of an inch move to the next pocket cut a quarter of an inch come back cut this one cut that one cut that one come back cut this one cut that one cut that one come back so it just does it in that order let me know if that's what you're referring to because that's the only two ways that i can take that question jeff so rewrite that and let me know uh hey ed welcome buddy sorry for the late hello uh i wasn't down there i didn't see you pop in uh let's see here um, if you haven't migrated to TNG, can you still do that? Mama Bryn, if you haven't migrated to TNG and you're still using CNC USB controller, can you still do that? Yes, you sure can. Uh, the only thing that's required is that you're using an MK34 board. So if I were to open up CNC USB controller, There's two things that are required, Mama Bren, to uh, migrate over to TNG. Number one, your CNC USB controller software. And Jeff, I'm waiting, re waiting for that question. So uh, um, both pockets are seven inches wide. Okay, so you are referring to what I'm talking about. We'll get right back to that in just one second here. Let me uh, throw up. CNC USB controller on the screen. <clears throat> okay. Man, my screen is so big uh, at this 1270 by 1080. All right. Uh, Mama Brain, there are two things that are required. Let this uh, reload here. Okay. First of all is go down to help and about and make sure that you have the latest version of the CNC USB controller software, which is 1807-2601. Okay. If you don't, you can download that off of the digitalwoodcarver.com website. Under the owner's menu, uh, support and downloads, scroll all the way to the archives at the bottom of the page and you'll see uh, the CNC USB controller section. It'll say to download this version, 210-1807-2601. You can download and install that. You have to be updated to the latest version before you can migrate over to Planet CNC TNG. So that's one, number one main thing number two uh if you went into your cnc usb controller and you went to your activate license window uh if you're connected to your cnc machine it will show your serial number here where right now i'm not connected to a board so it says no serial number but it'll show your serial number now that serial number is either going to end with mk2 or mk3 if it ends with an mk3 then you can migrate over to tng if it ends with an MK2, then unfortunately your board is not TNG compatible and you would have to update your board and it would be a $300 update board and you would order that from us. All right, let's get back to our Vectric. Boom. All right, so um, welcome. Let's see here. What I meant to say, okay, so Jeff, uh, we'll get back to you. Bear with me a second. Doug, all right, Doug is just giving a shout out. Hey, Laney, hello to everybody else. Uh, it's his first time here. Thank you, Doug, for joining. Uh, and um, uh, what pressure machine really enjoyed the visit. Thanks, Doug. Uh, Doug just picked up his machine and uh, he's new to Spindle TV. So thanks for joining us, Doug. Doug, tonight we're just doing a basic Q&A and uh, question and answer and stuff. So if, if you 
feel free to chime in if you have any questions on anything. Just jump right in. Uh, there's no such thing as a dumb question on Spindle TV. Ask away. Um, okay, so Jeff has been clarifying uh, what he meant to say was a profile cut. All right. So what I, what he meant to say was a profile cut. He forgot to say uh, that the pocket is seven inches wide. Well, let's call uh, them dados. Okay, let's call them dados because a dado, a groove, and all, I can I can get along with that. All right, so we got a six-inch dado, okay? A six-inch long dado that's a quarter-inch wide and a quarter-inch deep. I can get on board with that. All right, so we've got a uh, six-inch dado. So let's go in here, and um, it's a quarter-inch wide, six inches long. And uh, dado typically means it's going against the grain of the wood, so we'll throw it up there. All right. Now, what we want to do, and it's a quarter inch wide, and you need to go a quarter inch deep, right? All right. So, how can you cut that uh, as a uh, you know a dado so it'll just move from one to the next? Well, if it were wider than a quarter of an inch, then you would do it as a pocket cut. Uh, but since this is a quarter of an inch and you're going to use a quarter inch end mill, we're going to do it as a profile cut. So we're going to draw a line six inches long. Space bar. And then let's say that I have two dados side by side. So I'll offset that one uh, outward. Uh, let's say that they're um, three quarters of an inch apart. Okay, we've got two dados here that need to get cut. I'm going to select both of those, and that's going to be a um, profile tool path. We're going to cut a quarter of an inch deep with a quarter of an inch end mill, and I highly recommend doing a down cut bit, especially if this dado is going to be uh, uh, where another board is going to join it, like a piece of you know your joinery. You want a nice, clean edge. You don't want an all chipped up edge and stuff, uh, you know, on your glue joint. You want it to look nice and sharp. So I recommend a down cut end mill uh, for your dado. Uh, we're going to cut on the line, and <clears throat> what we're going to do is uh, the the second part of that question. Let's go back up to the second part of that question. Uh, now that we know that it's dados, how can I cut a dado a quarter of an inch deep, quarter inch wide, you know, six inches long, uh, and make it move to the right stop point and then move to the left to finish the pocket and then move up to the pocket, next pocket, do the same. I still, damn it, I'm still lost on that question. All right, let me see if I can uh, get this. What I'm going to do is I'm going to change on this one. I'm going to go into node edit mode. Uh, follow along with me here. I'm going to go into node edit mode. And on this vector here, I'm going to make this node the start point. Okay. And I want this router bit to come up, cut, raise up, come over, and cut this one back. Okay. And I'm hoping that's what uh, your question is kind of referring to. On this, I'm gonna cut here or select here. I'm gonna select this one second. And I'm gonna be on the line and on my order, I'm going to uncheck these and check the vector selection order. I want it to cut this one first, this one second. And the start at, I wanna keep the current start point. So when I calculate this, if we look, what's gonna happen is, is the bit's going to come down and cut, come over, raise up, move over to the other one, come down and cut, come out and exit. Okay. So if we were to preview that, let's see if we can turn it down nice and slow. Uh, it's going to come in and cut that step. It's going to raise up and then it's going to cut that one back the other direction. Okay. And now I have it set in two passes. You could actually do that in one pass. You don't need to do it in two passes. You could do it in one. But I want it, the reason why I put the start point down here is, and if I had another line here, the start point would be up there. I want to go boom, over, boom, over, boom, over, boom. I want to minimize my runtime. I don't want it to cut here, then have to raise up, go all the way back to a start point here, and then cut, go all the way back. I want it to cut, 
move over, cut, move over, cut, move over, cut. So if I had continuous lines, let's keep off. Oops. Cutting that. Okay. On my start point, I want this one to be there. This start point to be there. That one to be there. And this start point to be here. Make start point. And I want to use the vector selection order. Ah, hold my shift key down. Okay, I want to cut in that order. And um, quarter inch deep on the line with a quarter inch in mill. I want to use the vector selection order. And I want to keep start points. And Mike asked why this would be a handy question. So it's kind of you both are kind of in this together. Uh, if we preview this, it's going to come and cut. And I should do it in one pass, but I got it set for two passes. It's going to come back and cut this one. Yeah, that's kind of a, it makes no sense to do it that way if I'm doing it in two passes. So let me stop that. Let's uh, open that back up. Let's edit those passes and recalculate that. All right. So it's going to come and cut, raise up, move over and cut, raise up, move over and cut, raise up, move over and cut, and cut. Minimize my distance of travel. I don't need all that excess travel and everything. So hopefully, Jeff, hopefully I got the, I got the gist of it and that answered your question. All right, let's see here. All right, Mike is, uh, here's a question that people always, uh, that are come up is two-sided projects. People are still kind of struggling with that. So this is great. Two-sided project, just about ready to make tool pass. If I recenter, if I recenter the top side, Will the bottom side adjust automatically or do I have uh, or have I just hosed my project? All right. So. <clears throat> let's say, for instance, Mike, that uh, you have. Um, you know. Vectors on one side. And then. We want to take let's make this a two sided job. Uh, flipping along the Y. Okay. <clears throat> Let's say that I have these pockets going to get cut out on side one. Uh, and then on side two, there's going to be a shallow pocket on side two using this same vector. So I'm going to copy that to the other side. And then I have a profile cut that's going to be copied to the other side. Okay. And let's say I created my tool pass and stuff, and then I realized that, uh, you know, none of this stuff is uh, matching up. You know, it's not centered. And I'm like, oh, shoot. And I need to go in there and actually recenter it all. Well, if we look at the vectors that are on the other side, those light green lines, you have to go to the other side of the project and recenter those as well get those lined back up, right? If you don't, then your project is going to be off. Let me know if that answers your question. Okay, you've got to go to the other side and, and either two things. One, if you move these vectors, let's say I needed this up here, you know, and I need the other side to be exactly where that is, then your best bet is to come over here and delete the vectors that are on side two and come back and recopy the vectors back to the other side. So that way they're mirrored perfectly where they belong. Okay. So I, that's going to be the way that I would advise you to take care of that. 
but yeah, uh, in a way you kind of hose yourself if you didn't change the vectors on the other side. Let me know if that answers your question or if I was totally wrong with what you were asking. <laughs> Sometimes it's hard to, uh, you know, interpret the questions. All right. Um, okay. So Bob here. No, I didn't miss your laser going up and down. Uh, I told you I would get back to you when we were done with the burl. So Bob, uh, your question was, how do I keep my laser from moving up and down when I carve? Well, let's, uh, let me get. Uh, rid of these vectors and let's get back over here all right let's say that i am laser engraving a design okay i want to laser engrave in between the lines here right i want to kind of engrave this rectangle out if you will so i'm going to use a pocket toolpath now, my laser is zeroed out two inches from the above my material. So the bottom of the laser is two inches above the material when you set that zero for that laser. And we don't want it moving up or down from that point. Okay. So your cut depth is going to be zero. Okay. When you zero out two inches above the material, that's your cut depth. Okay. Zero. We don't want that, rate, that laser moving up and down. So your cut depth is zero. And you're going to, of course, you know, choose your digital laser tool, calculate your tool path, you know, to get that laser engraving. Now, we just calculated the tool path, but we didn't go up and do, we, we set the cut depth to zero, but we didn't do anything with the material setup. That means it's still going to raise up after it's done cutting the line. It's still going to raise up 0.2 inches before it moves to the next line. And then it's going to come down 0.2 inches and carve and this and that. We don't, we don't need it raising up or down, up or down, up or down. We just need it to just go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So your clearance. That needs to be zero, zero. And as far as your home start position uh, for your laser, uh, that's also going to be zero. Okay, we don't need it to raise up and then come back down when we hit start. We want to be a zero. Now, so these need to be zero and our cut depth needs to be zero. Okay, so now that I've changed that, now I want to come back into my tool path and recalculate it. Okay. All right. Now, with that being said, Let's say you're laser engraving. You've made all those changes and everything. And uh, the next project, you come back and you're sitting here and you're designing and you're doing a V card, not a laser project. You need to absolutely make sure that you come back to your material setup. Okay. And you need to make sure that you come in and adjust these. Now, Notice that the uh, Z gap above material and all changed. It wouldn't let me go straight to zero, right? It has kind of a minimum. So there's going to be a slight move up and a slight move down. Uh, it will not let me set a zero gap above the material. Okay, so it's a minimum of 0.2 of an inch, 0.21. So it's basically, uh, you know, um, Kind of going to add that in i can't i can't set it to zero but you need to make sure that these get set back to your standard defaults before you go calculating your v carve toolpath and all of that stuff okay so you're not if you have a zero cut depth it's not going to move up and down while it's cutting uh but there is going to be a slight um raise up when it's moving from one place to another there's no avoiding that by that point two of an inch you know so hopefully that answered your question so you set your cut depth to zero calculate that and then your home start position you can change on your material setup you can change your um plunge 
to zero. We don't need it to plunge up or down or down uh, clearance, uh, but you're, it's going to default to a 0 0.2 clearance. I can't set that to zero. Uh, it'll just, if I set it to zero, it'll just automatically give me a 0 0.21. So if I click OK, it's automatically going to give me a 0 0.21 here. So, uh, and a 0 0.2 there. So I can't, I can't avoid that. So there is going to be a slight up and down during when it's moving from one area to the other. Okay. All right. All right. Let's see here. Um, all right, Jeff, I answered it right. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. Let's see here. Uh, Dave G. I downloaded it. Haven't had a chance. Oh, you guys are chatting amongst yourselves. I'm sitting there reading, thinking their questions. My design today started cutting at point eight high, even after zeroing. I know I selected it too long. This is a common thing uh, that people get. Um, my design started cutting at point eight inches high, even after zeroing. I know I selected something wrong, and you're not the only one. Uh, what you want to look for, um, John, uh, Jonathan, is when you set up your job, okay, when you set up your job, uh, let's get out of the, let's go back to a single-sided job here. Uh, if you zeroed out on the material surface, okay, Z0 material surface, uh, your home start position uh, is going to be either my, whatever your default is. Uh, but you want to zero out there, and uh, if you've got this set to machine bed and you touch off on your top surface, forgetting that you had this set to machine bed, then it's going to carve in the air. It's going gonna, it's gonna to air carve. It's not going to come down and hit your wood and everything. So make sure you don't have machine bed selected and you're actually zeroing out on the top of your board. Make sure you've got material surface selected. All right, that's number one. Number two is if your machine's Z has limits uh, and stuff, when you do your touch off and all, um, make sure that you do not have an offset in your program. Uh, I'm not. I'm gonna. I'm not gonna assume anything. But let's say, for instance, that you're using. Uh, let me find my programs here. With this big old screen, all my icons are spread over uh, the country. Bear with me while this pulls up. All right. Now, in the Planet CNC TNG software, we have a work tab and a machine tab. Okay. Uh, your machine tab is your machine's absolute position. And when you're zeroing out, you're zeroing out your machine's absolute position. You want to make sure that you're not in the work tab, because if you're zeroing out in the work tab, you're creating an offset. If I come over and um, look at my datum in the software here, and if I have my machine zeroed out here, but I have set my work position, let's say I have that set to one inch. Now my datum line is no longer on the datum. It's basically saying that my machine is over here and my work position is over here start carving over here it's an offset and the same thing applies with the z if i'm zeroed out uh you know in the work position is zero my machine position should be different so make sure you're not working in the work tab if you're in planet cnc tng and if you're in any other controller just make sure you don't have a work offset if you're in TNG to clear a work offset out, uh, the tool on the left, it's a square box with an X in the middle or this slash if you're in the newer software. Uh, that removes the offset to make it match your machine tab. That's another reason for carving high. Uh, 
third reason is after doing your touch off you've raised your machine up and hit your limit and lost the coordinate and um now you're cutting you know off from what you should be carving but most likely it's going to be a work offset within the controller program or it's going to be you've got it set for uh, material bottom and you touched off on the surface okay so uh make sure that that uh what it is all right jonathan he he confirmed that that's what it was okay all right let's see here um what would be a good set of bits to buy for starting out and where to buy uh charles um you can go to like a Rockler or Woodcraft, even Amazon, uh, toolstoday.com, digitalwoodcarver.com. We sell bits. Uh, a good starter bit is the White Knight 705 5 starter bit set. Um, that bit set gives you a 60 degree V bit, a 90 degree, a crunch upcut spiral bit, an 8 inch tapered ball nose bit, and a 16th inch tapered ball nose. Uh, your bits are for your V carving, your in mills, your workhorse, pocket cuts, profile cuts, drilling operations, rough cuts, and your two ball nose bits for 3D finish bits, uh, you know, for your 3D finish details. So with those five bits, you can get a whole lot of stuff done. Um, from there, uh, you know, and, and Rockler and Woodcraft stores uh, sell white side bits, and they have those five pieces of sets. We sell it at woodcarver.com. Uh, on our shop page, right? It. Uh, Amazon, you know, you can get it from Amazon. The Whiteside 705 starter bit set is a good one. Um, if you have a little bit more uh, 3D carving, uh, you know, aspiration stuff, we do have an eight piece mana bit set, uh, which is uh, really nice. Uh, Whiteside bit set runs you for 50 bucks. And mana eight piece bits is around three hundred dollars. Um, <clears throat> great bits, uh, great places to buy bits is toolstoday.com. I can't say enough about them. They sell uh, a mana tools uh, primarily, uh, but they have a great selection of router bits. Uh, any bit that you could possibly want, tools t o o l s today.com uh, is a good place um, uh, to get bits. Uh, Digital Wood Carver, we sell a variety of white side and Amana bits uh, and bit sets and things. You can check us out. But absolutely, you can run down to Rockler or Woodcraft, uh, Amazon, and uh, and stuff. Um, you even in a pinch, I mean, they're in a, they're low price bits like you know Bosch and Irwin and all. But if you have to run down to Lowe's to grab an end mill to get you through a project, you can do that. But I don't recommend them being your Go to bits. Uh, uh, I, there's two brands that I kind of stand behind is uh, Man and Whiteside. Um, I like those. And uh, Magnate, even, I like the Magnate bits also, uh, especially their surface planing bits. So, all right. Uh, anybody else? Is my audio lagging? Let me know. Uh, Carl said my audio is lagging. Let me know. Let me know, testing one, two, three. Let me see if I can get the minions to work on my audio. Okay. You guys get to work. All right. Yeah, it probably lags. Um, uh, I, I got a new headset, so uh, we'll see if um, how well it does. All right, let's see what we got here, guys and girls. Uh, any questions? Any more questions? Yes. Here's another question. If you get time, how do I spread out fonts so I eliminate overlaps when cutting letters? How do I space out my fonts? So I don't get overlaps with my letters. 
Well, there's a couple of ways that we can approach that. Number one is the edit text spacing and curve tool. So let's get some text on the board. And uh, let's use a font that is typically known for having a few overlaps here. All right, so in this one, this is a script font and those overlaps are intentional, right? Uh, so we would actually take this and depending on your version, in version 10, uh, I have the ability to click the weld tool and replace the font with uh, the overlaps removed. Okay, the weld tool under edit objects. Um, if I am in earlier versions and all, I can take and convert to curves, and then I can use my interactive tool, my interactive trim tool, and trim away those overlaps, right? Or if I just want to space them apart, then I would use the edit text spacing and curve tool. Uh, what this will do is uh, when I am presented with a font, When I put my mouse in that edit text spacing and curve, but when I put my mouse between two letters, you'll see the V and A with the black arrows pointing inward. Meaning if I left click, I'm pulling you know those together, just like those arrows. If I hold my shift key down, those arrows change direction. Meaning while I'm holding my shift key, if I left click, then I'm spreading those letters apart. Okay, that shift key held while you're clicking push them apart if that's what your uh you know requirement is you know if it's not intended that they're actually kind of script text and all if you need to push them apart now if you have multiple lines <clears throat> and let's say you want to not only edit the spacing of your letters but you also want to edit the spacing of your lines. You put the mouse between two lines and you can reduce the spacing by just left clicking. Or if you hold down your shift key, you can increase the spacing between your lines. So when you're between letters, you'll see the V and A pop up with the arrows. When you're between two lines, you'll see the line line pop up. Okay. All right. All right, let's see here why my audio is lagging. Let's see if we can go in and uh, fix a few things. All right, guys, sorry I blacked out for a moment. Uh, I had to restart my uh, stream. So hopefully uh, 
the audio stopped lagging. Now, it also might be my talking because I'm actually lagging. I've been working my ass off today, so I'm tired. Uh, and um, so it might be just me lagging uh, and everything, but we'll see. Because I've never had any problems with StreamYard yet as far as audio, but I am trying a new audio uh, synthesizer and things, and uh, we'll see if uh, that fixes it. All right. No, no, Jonathan. <clears throat> now this is what this is what is important. I'm gonna throw this up on the screen, Jonathan. But says, are, sorry for asking beginner questions. Absolutely not. Don't ever apologize for that. And you guys and girls, ask your questions. Whether you think they're beginner questions or dumb questions or what have you, ask them. That's what I do this for. That's what I. That's why Spindle TV exists is to help teach you guys the Vetric software, CNC CAD, CAM design, uh, and I'm here for those questions, all of those questions. Don't ever apologize for asking a question because, you know, uh, you have it. You got that question. Ask it, and I'll do my best to answer it for sure. Um, all right, so good. All right, all right. Okay, let's see if I, let's go back up here. How do I get spread out font? Okay, what we're going to do, guys, uh, it's kind of just a basic night. You know, we didn't have really a design. It was more of a discussion and stuff. But um, are there any, I, I really uh, want you to, uh, it sounds like robots at a time. Now that, that could be, that could be, uh, I don't know, you know, if I start sounding like this and everything, then we got problems. Or if I start sounding like this. <laughs> then we got issues but uh you know um i'll see if i can get it fixed up and uh what i can do uh to make it not lag so much um all right guys and girls uh let's go ahead and uh if you have any time uh, questions we're gonna wrap up here early tonight uh it's been a long day for us all i'm sure uh and um i just wanted to go over some of the things uh i'm hoping that uh, I was able to answer a few questions that you might have. But tool databases, how to transfer files from, you know, a tool database from one computer to another. Uh, that's a good one to ask. So I'm glad you guys did that. All right. Does Jonathan know about the new website? You're talking about spindletv.com? That new website or what new website? Let me know. SpindleTV.com. Uh, it's underway. Oh, by the way, for you, all of my subscribers, the ones that actually subscribe to me and stuff, your March projects will be emailed out to you this week. Uh, I'm on it. I, I meant to make that announcement earlier and everything. Um, the March for you, all you subscribers, uh, the March projects. We'll be out this week uh, for those training subscribers and stuff. And if you're new here and wondering what in the world am I talking about at digitalwoodcarver.com on the training page of our website, you can actually subscribe uh, by the month or by the year for one-on-one -on -one training with me. Uh, when we train, uh, you get a video recording session, a video recorded session of a video recording of that session that you can refer back to. Uh, you get access to a couple of pro free projects a month. Uh, you get an hour a month. Uh, if you pay monthly, if you pay annually, then you get 12 hours to use throughout the year, however you want. Um, and uh, at digitalwoodcarver.com, not at spindletv.com right now, but it's digitalwoodcarver.com on the training page. You can set that up. And um, <clears throat> let's go ahead and uh, someone said, remind me how to schedule. Let's go ahead and do that. All right, we're going to open up a web browser. Go to Google Chrome. We're going to go on over here to www.digitalwoodcarver.com. And on the, uh, let's go into the website so you can see it too. Share a screen. I forgot I had to restart my system there. 
uh, digitalwoodcarver.com website. Under learn, you can go down to training on the training page. And when you get to the training page, if you scroll down, uh, there's a couple of, uh, you know, videos on this page as well. But if we scroll down, there is a scheduling section where you can actually schedule training, one-on-one -on -one training. Now, you can, you don't have to subscribe. You can hour by hour. Uh, but uh, as a subscriber for $10 a month, uh, you get one hour of one-on-one -on -one, uh, training with me uh, per month. You get two free project downloads each month. Uh, and uh, you also get a video recording of that training session to refer back to. Um, or you could pay uh, annually, uh, once a year. Uh, you could basically get 12 months for the price of 11. You get 12 hours to use anytime you want. It doesn't have to be once each month. You can use 12 hours straight if you wanted to. You get 24 uh, projects uh, downloads for the year, and also you get those video recordings for those sessions and everything. Um, now, <clears throat> Debbie, you're already a subscriber. Uh, so what you would do is you're returning, you would log in, or you would go back to your uh, confirmation email uh, to your account, and uh, there's a button in there to schedule appointments. Uh, but you can log in to your account and schedule that way there. Uh, if you were new and you subscribe, um, basically, you'll get a confirmation letter. Uh, with a coupon code, if you will, uh, for that hour each month. Uh, and that coupon code will get renewed each month. And you, when you schedule your session, uh, you'll just type in that coupon code and uh, you'll set up your appointment and all um, and everything. If you were just paying by the hour, you could click on here, set your time zone, uh, and then it'll take you to straight to the calendar. Uh, and uh, you can pick your time, whatever it may be. Uh, once you choose your time, click continue, and um, then it'll take you to the next page to fill out the information. You know, where you fill out your name, the type of software you have, what type of training you're looking for, maybe some specific topics. If it's a specific project, if you have a file that you want to send, you can send that. And then you can pay with either a credit card or with PayPal if you have a PayPal account. You know. So that is uh, something for sure that you could definitely um, take a look at. And uh, be sure to subscribe, not to not necessarily for the training, but subscribe to Spindle TV on YouTube because we do live free classes every Tuesday night from 7 to 9 p.m. Uh, and then I do offer these one-on-one uh, -on -one classes as well for individuals that want some one-on-one -on -one, uh, alone time with me. <laughs> training all right <clears throat> yes yes yeah doug absolutely uh you know now doug you're a new customer so actually uh you're going to get your two-hour orientation training for free your first two hours i'm a, you're a new customer right doug am i getting you mistaken with someone else didn't you just get your machine um Did you just get your machine? Let me know. And Doug, for your initial orientation training, uh, new customers get two hours uh, free training. Uh, and you will come down to that same training page, but you will click on this option here, new Digital Wood Carver purchase free orientation training. You will click here. You will set your time zone. You will pick your date. If a date's grayed out or if a time it does not show in here, that means I'm not available for that time or something. But you would pick your time, your start time, and you would click continue and you would come in and you would fill out, tell me what machine you have and what software you have. And then you would complete your appointment. You'll get a confirmation letter uh, with the remote assistant software that you'll download for our call. Uh, and that will get you started. Okay. That's your new customer, uh, Digital Wood Carver customer orientation. You get a two hour orientation for free. Okay. So, and you can set that up. There's no time limit on that, Doug. You can set that up anytime you're ready to do that and all. Um, all right. Uh, yeah, guys and girls, let's get off of uh, Digital Wood Carver and get back to 
me. It's all about me. No, I'm just kidding. Um, there are some things upcoming. Uh, I am working with a, I'm, I'm starting to, I'm going to start talking to a new designer uh, to help me create some very cool projects for not only the subscribers that get the two projects a month, but also there's going to be a project gallery uh, coming up on Spindle TV. When I get that site, that site is fighting me every step of the way. When I get that site locked tight, tight and right, uh, it'll be ready to go. But uh, there's going to be all kinds of project downloads and stuff that uh, you'll have access to. And they, they'll, they'll, they'll be paid projects. There's going to be some free because when we do classes, when I do project classes, usually I provide those files You know, on Tuesday nights. If there's a file to go along with it, I put it in the description of the video. But these are going to actually be full-on projects that you can download and vectors and models and stuff. Uh, and uh, I'm working with a designer that uh, are going to be working with a designer that's going to help me kind of produce those things for you guys to give a nice gallery going and stuff. So I'm looking forward to that launching. And then uh, Burl and I are talking about doing virtual shows uh, for digital woodcarver user groups uh, and things. Uh, and then we're going to do some Q and A's uh, in the shop at the machines and stuff. So my plate's about to get even more filled up. So that's, I'm happy. I'm, I'm blessed with that. So uh, it's going to be great. All right, everybody, we're going to take the last uh, few minutes here. And uh, if you have any questions, now's the time uh, to ask. So, um, I like my little sound effect. That's the clock ticking away. <laughs> Debbie, you said not seeing the computer. Oh, now we're seeing the computer. Oh, yeah, I wasn't showing you the screen uh, a moment ago. Sorry about that. I got some cool sound effects I'm playing with. I'm just messing around uh, and stuff. I think that's what's what's messing up with my audio. Uh, yep, everybody stay healthy out there with all the stuff that's going on. Uh, thanks, Tippy, for that. And um, thank you. Uh, I'm excited for me, too. And um, I appreciate it. I, it's all good. I'm, I'm blessed uh, with uh, you guys that are subscribing to me. Thank you for that. Uh, for um, I hope you're do you those of you that have done your one-on-one -on -one training with me. I hope you're enjoying that and those recordings and stuff, uh, and, uh, and and everything. So definitely be sure to um, you know uh, for more content. <laughs> Sorry, my mind is like blah today. Uh, but uh, be sure to give me a thumbs up and hit that like button. I know this is this wasn't a class video, but still give it a like button. It helps me out. Uh, and uh, next week, we're going to get into some uh, more designing. And within the Vetric software, we're going to have some fun. We're going to create some cool projects. Every Tuesday night from 7.15 till whenever we cut it off. Uh, usually, I try not to go past 10, guys. But uh, we do those live classes. And if you can't make the live classes, the uh, video is recorded. Uh, the, the session is recorded so that you can access it later on Spindle TV on YouTube. So youtube.com forward slash Spindle TV. And don't forget to subscribe and hit that bell notification uh, when you want to be notified of things like live events or when I post videos. Because uh, I'm going to be posting videos that are not necessarily live events. I'm going to be posting how-to videos that are short and to the point on a specific topic. You know, so you don't have to sit there and dig through two hours of video to figure out how do I do this? How do I do that? I'm going to short to the point videos that are not live. Uh, those are going to be uh, posted as well. And you want to be notified of that. So be sure to hit that subscribe button and share this with anybody that you know that has uh, Vetric CAD CAM design. Uh, we're here to help. All right. And thank you for all you do. I appreciate that. Look at all those. Look at that. I got five thumbs. Wait, one, six thumbs up. Yeah, six. Can't help it. All right. Thanks. I appreciate you guys. Um, give Definitely give a thumbs up. Uh, and uh, that just helps me. You know, it gives me that boost of uh, kudos, that, that, that attaboy. So I can, you know, it makes me just want to keep helping you guys. <laughs> All right, just kidding. 
Um, I'm hoping, I'm looking forward to doing some stuff in the shop at the machine. Uh, I don't know how we're going to work that as far as like you know, if we could carve something or maybe have something pre card where we do a little bit of carving, but that would be kind of annoying to be sitting there in a class listening to a router run. I don't, uh, you know, um, but I can show setup, I can show clamping, I can show different things. Uh, I'll get set up and all we'll do some we'll do some out at the shop stuff uh making projects some clamping techniques or some uh setups on how i approach things and stuff we'll throw those into the mix too so it's you know kind of like a we know how to create the designs but how do we carve it type of thing it kind of takes you to the machine and how to set it up and run it now that might you know it's going to apply it, it, for the most part it's going to apply to everybody but uh your your controller software if you're not a digital wood carver customer and you're using mock 3 or um uh ucnc uh and things like that you know those the procedures might vary some but for the most part cnc is cnc you know it, you know we can probably make it to where everybody understands and and then they can look at those lessons kind of adapt it for their machines and their needs and and stuff and all so all right everybody i appreciate you it's 9 23 we're gonna go ahead and cut out on this odd time number but uh i'm gonna go eat uh and uh get a good night's rest i've got a lot of videos to make and stuff so until next time i'll see you soon